It's the four-year anniversary of Sisko's wife Jennifer getting deaded by the Borg. Actually, that's not exactly true. It was yesterday, and the fact that he nearly didn't notice at all is bothering him. Jake's struggling a little too in his own way, and talking about the reason why helps both of them. There's probably a moral in that somewhere. Sisko's not ready to sleep and goes for a walk instead. His stargazing is interrupted by someone with lines, so let's drag out the wheel and see what we're going to call them. Our mystery guest will now be known as... Bethany Spork, offered by Ensign Ray Ray. A little chat on Bajoran constellations gives way to an introduction and then an amble along the promenade. The small talk is sufficiently entertaining that Sisko offers Bethany a tour of the station, though that's going to be difficult as she's just vanished. Maybe she was needed somewhere else, though it's a bit odd that she got away so quickly. It's the following morning in Ops, and Sisko is feeling jolly. So jolly that Kira's confused, not least of which because this is the first time she's seen him start his day with something other than Klingon coffee. Maybe it's dodgy, maybe he's just had his head turned from earlier, but we'll have to leave it there as the plot has arrived. It comes in the form of a scientist, a certain Professor Saitic, and he's a terraformer. Moulding entire worlds comes with a bit of a god complex, which is why he's currently in the middle of some electrical gubbins with only minimal concern for his safety, a level of concern apparently shared by the production team for anybody who suffers from photosensitive seizures, based on the strobes in this scene. The professor is an egotistical dick when you examine exactly what he's saying, but somehow manages to present it in a way that people find more likeable than, say, Bashir from season one. The mood is certainly more jovial than if he were just being merely tolerated by the others, though maybe that's because they realise he's completely out of his sodding tree. Not content with changing worlds, he's decided he wants to have a crack at jump-starting a dead star. You'd think that news would be enough to occupy anybody's mind, but Sisko still manages to be distracted when Dax talks to him about it a little later. She'll be going with the Professor and is talking about speed modifications for the ship, just in case it all goes pear-shaped, all of which passes by Sisko largely unnoticed, as he's looking for someone. Dax leaves him to it, which means he's alone when Bethany Spork finds him again. She apologises for rushing away when they met and wants to take him up now on that tour. They find themselves in one of the pylons offering a view of the station. Bethany's very taken with the whole thing, but mostly the company, it seems. A few seconds later and they've arranged to have a picnic here tomorrow. It's all going so well and Sisko comments on how right their conversations feel. Perhaps that jinxed it, as asking Bethany to talk about herself makes her say that she can't and then immediately flee. What a busy life she must lead. Sisko's distraction is getting worse, and Jake might be on the money when he asks if his dad is in love. He's learned the symptoms from eggnog, and despite the source, none of them are dodgy. Learning that he'd have Jake's blessing if that's what was happening helps Sisko open up and talk about her. Or try to, anyway, as there's not a lot to tell other than her curious disappearing trick, and Jake is left wondering if perhaps he was a bit premature about giving his blessing. Looks like even Sisko himself understands the situation isn't normal. He wants Odo to have a look into it, something that would be easier if he had actual data to go on beyond a name. Sisko's concerned she might be in trouble of some sort based on her behaviour, so Odo will do what he can. That same understanding that something's a bit off might also be why Sisko doesn't want to answer Dax's questions. She saw Sisko talking to Bethany Spork last night and wants details, so at least we know she's not a figment of his imagination now. Dax thinks Sisko's hesitation is because talking to Jadzia about women is different than talking to Curzon about women, though Sisko denies this and says there simply isn't anything to tell yet. Maybe she can needle something more from him over dinner. We've been invited onto the Professor's ship, partly for a meal, but mostly so he can carry on talking about how brilliant he is. Not everybody is taken with him, and Kira seems in agreement with his many ex-wives. Speaking of which, it's time to meet the current one. There's a touch of surprise when Bethany Spork is introduced, except she isn't, because this woman is called Nidel. Sisko and Dax have been seated at the far end of the table, so they can talk about it without being overheard. He's pretty sure it's the same woman, despite getting no response from her. Everybody else moving to another room gives Sisko a chance to hang back and talk to Nidel, who's staying here to clean up. Perhaps her assuming the invitation to continue talking elsewhere didn't include her is why she's been so reserved and uncommunicative during the meal. It might also go a fair way to explaining the professor's many ex-wives. 
She reacts with apparent confusion when Sisko talks to her as though they know each other. As far as she's concerned, they've never met. Odd thing, though, she shuts down upon hearing the name of her apparent doppelganger as though she recognises it before recovering and telling him he's mistaken. Sisko's convinced it's her, though he's not going to press the matter, despite Dax suggesting he should investigate further. Speaking of investigations, Odo's finished his, with no results for Sisko's disappearing woman. That's a moot point, says Sisko, as he's found her himself on the Professor's ship. Not possible, says Odo. When he says he checked everybody who came here, he means he checked everybody who came here. Sisko's mystery woman may well have arrived on the Professor's ship, but that's where she stayed, as there's no record of anybody leaving it, except the Professor himself. That makes it even more surprising when Bethany Spork meets him as he's going into his quarters. She's confused by Sisko's experience earlier with someone who looks like her, and it appears to be genuine, too. She's still evasive when asked about her past, and manages to distract him enough for some face mashing. I doubt the same trick will work next time, though, not when she disappears right in front of him. It's enough to make him want answers after all, and the best place for that is on the Professor's ship. That's why he's decided to join Dax in accompanying them when they set fire to a star's corpse. Our chosen method of committing celestial arson is by farting a shuttle at the dead star with a special toy on board. Presumably that helps us be further away than if it was loaded onto a standard firework or probe. The Professor might not give much of a damn about safety, but he's not the only person involved. Some of that bluster is gone, though, and it's to do with this mission. He's worried that topping this particular wonder might not be possible, and for someone who strives towards ever greater things, that's not an appealing prospect. The conversation turns to his current wife. She lived on a planet that he terraformed and turned into a paradise, but despite this, decided to leave with him to see the stars. I'd probably take that as a comment on my skills, personally, but he didn't see it that way, despite not really understanding why she chose to be with him. Maybe it's time to get answers for everyone. Sisko's quarters on the ship are already occupied by Bethany Spork, and he has the sense to call Dax in. As Bethany's telling him she's never leaving again, Dax arrives and starts scanning. Bit rude, but also useful, as we learn Bethany is made entirely of energy. Now we've got both of them in the same place, maybe having them meet would be the smart choice. It's not an option, sadly, as Nidel is busy being unconscious, and rather dangerously so, according to Dax. The Professor recognises Bethany, though, so that's a start. He also says Nidel told him that Bethany would never be back, so it looks like we're in psychic shenanigans territory. The Professor tells us Nidel is a telepath who can create projections. Bethany Spork is one such projection, though not consciously controlled. Being told you don't exist isn't much fun, so Dax takes Bethany away while Sisko learns more. Lore dump time, and we're told Nidel is from a species who can lose control of their psychic shenanigans if they get too upset. It's happened before and nearly killed her, and the Professor is at least smart enough to realise being with him isn't exactly a bed of roses. The other wives scarpered after they realised he was a cock, but that's not an option for Nidel. Her species mates for life, which you'd think would make them a little more cautious when selecting a partner. This is clearly not great news for Bethany Spork when Sisko has a chat with her. Either Nidel lives by her disappearing, or Nidel dies and she disappears anyway. Maybe that's why Sisko's getting in some face mashing while he can. This, too, is ill-fated, it seems, as he's called to the bridge. The shuttle that's going to set fire to a dead star has taken off, and the Professor is flying it himself. He knows fixing the problem with Nidel today just means it'll happen again on some unknown tomorrow. I'd argue him being the one to file for divorce might be a better option than exploding himself, but this gives him a chance to go out on a high, so he's taking it. Maybe he even feels it's penance of a sort for not having stopped it earlier. Either way, he's the centre of attention, and he's not going to waste it. Some more egotistical waffle precedes last words that are frankly pretty uninspired for someone who's supposed to be a genius, but at least he dies afterwards. The dead sun reigniting is an apt memorial for him. What better tribute than an overheated ball of gas that's harmful to anything which gets too close? We're back on Deep Space Nine to deal with the aftermath. Bethany Spork disappeared after the Professor turned himself into crispy bacon, and Nidel doesn't remember any of it. 
She'll be leaving shortly, going back to the planet her dead husband turned into a paradise. I imagine that might cause one or two awkward conversations, given the circumstances surrounding the death of their hero, but that's not Sisko's problem, so we'll leave him to his memories of a woman who never existed. Until the next adventure. A Sisko episode, then, and one that starts by grappling with the complications of adapting after the loss of a loved one. The issue was handled well enough, and they had the good sense to involve Jake in it too, as this isn't only Sisko's pain. It's a cliché, of course, but no less true as a result, and something many of us have experienced firsthand. Time heals, but in a way that's almost a different kind of wound. It makes us question what mattered the most to us, and whether the memories of how we felt can be true if we're able to carry on. That's just how we're built, though. Emotional damage gets covered with scar tissue of a sort. It's how we learn to function again, and it doesn't make what came before any less real. The narrative purpose for this whole thing, of course, is to underline that Deep Space Nine's most eligible widower is up for a bit of the old sexy times if the right person comes along. It frees him from the label of grieving husband, something he's been conspicuously carrying around since the pilot, and opens up more story options for later episodes. It feels a little dismissive to summarise it as such, but that's pretty much the conversation that was had on a production level. A bit of reading tells me the original script was supposed to have Bashir in the driving seat until one of the co-creators of the series moved it to Cisco. the logic being that it would make him more relatable to viewers. There's probably a whole conversation to be had there about why they thought relationships make characters easier to empathise with, and the unintentional implications for some people who are asexual or aromantic, but that's likely long enough to be its own video. For my part, I found the first couple of minutes with Jake did more to make Sisko feel human than the entire romance plot, but maybe you feel differently. We'll move on to a point in the episode, shall we? Is there something in what Dax says about gender being the reason Sisko doesn't want to discuss his blossoming romance? There are a few different ways to explain his response. It could be that Sisko genuinely doesn't think there's enough data to share, something driven home in stark clarity when he tried explaining things to Odo just before he saw Dax. It could also, ironically, be the opposite of what Dax suspects. If Sisko still sees Dax as the mentor who guided him, the oddness surrounding this situation might be the reason he didn't want to discuss it, fearing that he'd look foolish in the eyes of someone he admires. The more obvious answer is that Dax is on the money. The idea of there being conversations that you just don't have with a woman carries a hint of the more open sexism of the era, though you could view this as a deliberate attempt to call that out, rather than a product of those biases in itself. Still, at least there's enough ambiguity in this one that you can decide your own reason, depending on how generous you want to be. Based on review scores, most people are in agreement that this isn't a great episode, so let's end on a compliment. I'm one for subtle storytelling, and this look from O'Brien when Professor Sayatik is blowing his own trumpet speaks whole paragraphs. There's the overt this guy's a wanker stare, of course, and it's worth it just for that, but there's also a little look round at the others when he's doing it. Without making a sound, Colmini has said, Are they... are they okay with this? Is this normal for them? And why is this my problem? I'm not even command staff. I just fix the replicators. I could be at home with my wife and daughter, who I never get to see because of all the shit that kicks off here, and instead I'm here listening to this guy tell me how great he is. I didn't sign up for this. This is why we have officers, to do all the stuff that isn't actual work. DS9 has a lot of good things going for it, but I think one of the most subtly useful is the inclusion of Miles O'Brien. Having an everyman who just wants to get on with the job and then go home to his family helps show us how removed from normality everybody else is by comparison, and that's a powerful tool when employed creatively. End of episode. I can't believe that worked. I told you, stick your words to a tune and most people don't care what it says as long as they can tap their feet to it. It's like a kind of hypnosis. And now we have something we can do for money if we need to. Yeah, well, maybe we shouldn't get the viewers expecting them on the reg, eh? That was loads more effort than two dogs just talking bollocks, and this whole thing was only ever supposed to be an excuse for the credits. Fair point. So, what are we gonna do now we're out? I don't know about you, but I want to know who the hell those other dogs were. I told you before, they were in a flashback. We weren't even supposed to hear them. Well, it's done now, and we need a new plot device now that we're out of prison. Alright, fine, I guess we're doing this then. Woof.